King, King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We bless your name, Jesus, Jesus. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord, this is our story. This is our life. And our life will be a continuation of praise unto you in all circumstances. Hallelujah. Church, as we sing this song, let this be a prayer. Let this be a place of conviction. Oh, blessed assurance. Blessed assurance. Jesus is.
keep our eyes on the things of eternal, on the things that matter to your heart, Lord. And one day with all the saints and the angels, we will sing.
let's stretch our hands to heaven let's just praise the lord bless the lord for a few moments let the inner wells lord from our innermost being let living waters flow in jesus name come on just bless the lord lord we say this morning spring up a well spring up a well let from the, our innermost being god flow rivers of living waters let worship arise come on show them Father, there's no greater desire as we come into your presence this morning than to just touch your heart, God. That our worship will be pleasing unto you, God. Lord, nothing else matters, God. We do not come, for, Lord, just to be entertained, God, just to hear a word from you. But Lord, our desire as your people, as we gather here on a Sunday morning, it is to bless you, God. It is to say that you are worthy, God. It is to say that everything that we have and all that we are comes from you. And this morning, we will give you all the praise. We give it all back to you. We say that you come from you, God. Apart from you, we are nothing, God. We have nothing. And so we say you are worthy, of our praise you are worthy of it all and so we thank you God and we bless you God in Jesus name and all God's people say Amen and Amen come on let's make His praise glorious we bless you God we bless you Jesus we bless you Jesus Hallelujah Hallelujah Amen now before you take your seats why not turn to three other people whom you have not met before greet them in the name of the Lord. David said that I was glad when they say unto me, that let us go unto the house of the Lord together. And it is a joy to gather with the body of Christ this morning at our second service of Cornerstone Katong. Now I just want to extend a very warm welcome to you. Now if there's any one of you who is your first time here and you are visiting, now we have a QR code right, coming right up on the screen. Just Kindly scan the QR code, fill up the form. We want to know you a little bit better. And also in the form, you can choose a drink that is on us, all right? And so at the end of the service, head on down to the level two, the Next Steps Lounge. Our team will serve you your drink, let you know a little bit more about the church and you can ask them any questions that you have and you have a desire to be part of a cell community here in Cornerstone. Um, they will help you and connect one cell group to you as well. Now this week is Holy Week, it's Palm Sunday, it's the start of the Holy Week. Now it's all leading up to um, Resurrection Sunday, right? Next week will be Good Friday, we'll celebrate Good Friday and Resurrection Sunday. On your way in, you will have gotten this Holy Week Bible reading plan, alright? This is the plan that we have come up for you. Now in, in it, you know the scriptures... Uh, will tell you from chronologically what happened from Palm Sunday, which is today. It's the eighth day. Uh, 
timeline all the way that led Jesus to the cross and not and does not just end there, He rose again from the dead. Amen. <laughs> now, I want to encourage you to be part of the reading plan. I was just really thinking about it and I really believe that the Lord will give us a fresh new revelation of who He is as we uh, partake of this. Amen. <laughs> Let's not lose the wonder of the death, of His death and His resurrection. So if you can, just take part in this. Uh, it's going to be a wonderful week. Now, of course, next week leading up to that, we will have our uh, Easter production called Mirrorland. I hope you are excited. Now, this will depict a very insightful, relatable drama of the mirrors of our days and what does the mirror say and speak about us. Now, just to take note that there will be five shows next weekend. Um, it will be from on a, one show on Friday, two on Saturday and Sunday. And all Cornerstone Boogie services will be cancelled. So do take note of that. We will see you here at Cornerstone Katong. When I encourage you, this is our plus one event. Invite a friend. Amen. Invite a friend. Jesus died for them all and everybody. We want to let them hear the good news and the gospel of Christ. We, let's believe for souls. Amen. I want to encourage you to pray and believe that the Lord will touch your friend's heart as they come. Now, uh, this weekend, if you're thinking of giving unto the Lord, we have uh, uh, the website coming right up. It's uh, cscc.org.sg slash give. Alright? And uh, in there, you will find the QR code to give unto the Lord. If you want to give via credit card, bank transfer, you can uh, head over there for more information as well. Alternatively, you may actually, um, at the end of the service, drop your offerings in the offering baskets towards the exit. Let's give unto the Lord with a cheerful heart for the Lord loves a cheerful giver. Let us pray for our offering as we give. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we come before you this morning once again. We say that all that we have belongs to you and it's just a small token, God, of worship as we are giving unto you this morning. May it speak much about the goodness of God in our life. May it speak much, Lord, about how well you have loved us, you have given to us, you have not restrained, but Lord, you have given it all to us so that we might have life and life more abundantly. So we give you I give it back to you and may it bless your heart. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we have a video coming up right up uh, to give you more information about what's happening in church in the coming weeks. Uh, you will be blessed and let's prepare our hearts for I believe that the Lord will speak to us as Pastor Young bring in a word in season. Amen. Have a great weekend. It's the weekend and we're so glad you're here. Holy Week is coming up, and we have a Good Friday and Resurrection Weekend special lined up. Step into the whimsical world of Mirrorland, where every reflection online and around us seeks to tell us who we are or can be. How do we know which images to trust? And how can we discern the voice of truth? Happening across five services from 29th to 31st March. Boogie services will be cancelled, so join us at Cornerstone Kartong and invite a pre-believing friend for this plus one event. Showtimes and details can be found on our website events page. Our 2024 first quarter training and equipping series is starting in April. Want to recalibrate your work life for God's kingdom? Learn to see your work beyond the daily grind. Sign up for the Recalibrating Your Work Life course and realign your vision to God's purpose for your workplace. Check this out and the full lineup of courses available on our website TNE page. Registration closes on 26 March. Our next Prayer for Nations. Pray for the nations and the work at our Cornerstone Global Network in this Zoom prayer. Register at bit.ly slash pfnzoom. At FaithWorks this week, we've stocked up on faith-building resources for your young ones. Get your children fueled on God's Word through a beautiful selection of Bible activities and storybooks. Get them in-store or online at faithworks.com.sg. Now, let's honor the Lord with our giving. For those who are on-site, giving buckets are situated at the exits. Online giving options are available on our website giving page. As we prepare for the message today, you can head over to our website homepage and download the sermon slides. Have a powerful time in the Lord. Come on, let's give God praise. Hallelujah. Amen. What a great day to be in the house of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Before I begin today, I just felt the Lord to pray for a community of people here in, in Cornerstone. Now, if you are from Africa, any part of Africa, would you stand please? Because I just want to take a few moments to pray for all the African people that are here in, in Cornerstone. Anybody else? I know we had some people in the first service as well. You know, the, God has placed upon the African people an unusual anointing for prayer. 
unusual anointing for prayer. And uh, I've been in uh, many parts of Africa. I've been in Lagos, where they had overnight prayer meetings at the Redemption City. Over a million people coming, praying right through the night. Amazing, amazing thing that's happening. And they have a wonderful anointing for prayer. And when I see God joining Africans into our community, it's, it means that God is going to ramp up the prayer life in this church. Amen. So I want to take, ask you to just take a few moments, stretch out your hands, and let's pray for this community. Father, I thank you for what you're doing in the African community here in Singapore. And I pray that you will bring others, Lord, others from other nations uh, in that great continent of Africa, and that they would come, oh God, and that, Lord, the spirit of prayer that you have placed upon them uh, will rub off on the Singaporean Christians, oh God, and that, Lord, there will be a ramping up of prayer and the spirit of prayer here in this church as well, Lord. And we see something shifting, Lord. Oh, Ramba Tababo Sanda, when we see, Lord, the communities and the different people from the different ethnicities coming together and crowning Jesus as King of Kings and Lord of Lords, we just give you the glory and praise. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Thank you so much for being with us today. I want to talk to you about the predicament with respectability. A story was told of a woman in New Zealand many years ago. She loved and adored the queen and the royal family. The queen was visiting a city that she was living in. She was excited and elated, but she was a woman of short stature like Zacchaeus. And so she tried to get to the street early to get a vantage view of the queen passing. But when she got there, the street was jam-packed with people and there was no way that she could get to the front to see the queen. And she saw a dumpster and she climbed on top of the dumpster. And as the queen and the entourage was passing by, she jumped up and down, waved and whistled and danced. Now, how many of you know that if the queen was not passing by that day, that woman would have looked very foolish and pretty silly, right? But because the queen was passing by, what she did was totally and completely appropriate. My question to you is, what is going to happen? What will you do when the king is passing by? Not just any king, but the king of all kings. Do you know what the problem with most of us here in an Asian culture is? It's respectability. And respectability is a direct descendant of pride. Especially in our Asian cultures, we care too much of what other people think. And if we don't break through the barrier of respectability, we are going to miss some of the most amazing encounters and miracles in our lives. Just read your Bibles, my friends. The ones who are most willing to lose their respectability and even look sometimes undignified in the presence of God were the ones who received their miracles. How many times have we read in Scripture that in the presence of a large multitude, someone would come and throw themselves at the feet of Jesus and worship Him and they could care less what people would think and they always walked away with their miracle. Amen. And it was in their desperation, their willingness to humble themselves and sometimes even look silly if necessary that got them their miracles. Ladies and gentlemen, it's okay to be undignified in the presence of the Almighty King. Of the Almighty King. He doesn't mind it. So don't let those demons of respectability hold you back from your blessing. When you say to yourself, what if I look silly and you hold back, you might just miss out on some of the greatest moments in your life. We all remember the story of Mary of Bethany, how she broke an alabaster jar of spikenard and lavishly poured it at the feet of Jesus, wiped it with her hair. Boy, you talk about the loss of respectability. You talk about an embarrassing moment and situation, but Mary could care less what people were thinking about her. She was so in love with Jesus. And then that one extravagant act of worship was singled out by Jesus. And he said, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what this woman has done for me ought to be preached as well. What an honor he bestowed on Mary. She broke through the barrier of respectability. There was another woman in the Bible with an issue of blood who heard Jesus passing by. She didn't care what other people thought. She was going to reach out, stretch her hands and touch the hem of a garment, of his garment. She must have pushed. She must have shoved everyone around her like a woman on a Black Friday shopping spree. Hallelujah. And she got what she pressed in for. Amen. 
A blind beggar named Bartimaeus said, begging when he heard Jesus is passing by and hope fill his heart for the first time. This man was born blind, never saw in his life. And he reached out by screaming at the top of his lungs, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. He embarrassed everyone but Jesus. Woo! And those around him tried to silence him because he was making such a ruckus and he would not be silenced, cried even louder, Son of David, have mercy on me. And when you are desperate, you don't care what people think. And blind Bartimaeus walked away, got God his miracle that day. Hallelujah. Story was told of a fashionable lady who was dressed in silk and satin, standing on a curb of a busy Parisian street. When to a horror, a ring with a jewel of great value to her fell and slip of her, her glove and fell into the filth of a gutter. Now, what would you have done? What would you have done? Well, that cultured woman, without hesitation, bent down and with the umbrella that she had, the, the, the hook with the umbrella, she tried to search for it in the drain and she could not find it. And she then pulled her gloves out to the horror of all the unlooking, uh, unlooking uh, crowd. And she was a cultured woman and she slipped her dainty hands and delicate fingers into the mud and the grime to search for the jewel until she, until she found it. When you lose something of great value, my friends, you don't care what other people think. Amen. And we got to get past that barrier of respectability. We've got to get past that barrier of, of thinking that we are addicted. Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to press in. If Jesus is walking past, what would you do? Amen. Many years ago, my wife and I, we were in Penang. We took our family for a short vacation. Uh, we were uh, walking along a very busy intersection in Penang, in the city, for a few moments, I turned my head and when I turned back, my son Josiah was missing. And I panicked, my wife panicked, we just run up and down the mall. We were screaming, literally, I went to the security guard, Where, did you see a boy, did you see a boy? You know, and uh, almost, he was almost intimidated by that and uh, we were ru running around, did you see my son, did you see my son? I panicked, I tell you, I never felt fear like I felt fear like this. I think he's somewhere in the crowd today, that rascal. You know? <laughs> And I was, uh, I was just uh, panicking and several minutes passed by. He was missing. And then I passed the McDonald's. I saw his head bumping up and down. Of course, it had to be McDonald's, right? What was I thinking? But what a relief. I say all of that to say that when you're desperate, you don't care what other people are thinking. Amen. When the Japanese attacked uh, Pearl Harbor in the December of 1941, America declared war on Japan. They knew that they were about to enter into war against a nation whose culture they did not understand. Now, you've got to understand that Japan in the 1940s is different from the Japan of today. It was a closed nation. They didn't trade very much with the other nations, and they despised foreigners. You know this, right? And the Japanese people were an interesting people because they had an imperialistic mindset. They believed that all of Asia, especially the eastern part, the oriental part of Asia, were to be subjugated by the Japanese people and they were to be uh, in options, they, they were to bow in honor to the Japanese emperor who they worship as a god. So the Americans were about to get into a battle with a, with a nation that they did not understand. And if you're going to defeat your enemy, you've got to know how they think. So to get into the psychic of the Japanese people, they commissioned one of the great anthropologists of the 20th century. Her name was Ruth Benedict. And uh, after the war, she published her ideas in a book called The Chrysanthemum and the Sword. It's a book I'm reading right now. And one of the central features and insights was the difference between a shame culture and a guilt culture. Now, most Oriental cultures like the Chinese culture, like the Japanese culture, we are shame cultures. And the highest virtue in our culture is honour. We honour our parents, we honour our elders, we honour our traditions, uh, we honour our old ways and shame is when we feel that we have failed to live up to the expectations of people around us. It's always outwardly directed. But guilt, on the other hand, is what we feel when we fail to live up to our own expectations. And guilt is always inwardly directed. Now, shame cultures are visual. Has to do with how you appear or how you think you appear before people and their eyes. And the instinctive reaction when you are ashamed, what do you do? I wish I was invisible. I wish I was somewhere else. I wish I was hiding. Because the moment you think that you've done something stupid, our tendency, our default action is we withdraw from people. And we've seen this in cell groups. You know, when somebody's done something stupid, they just stop coming to cell group. 
Uh, because they feel ashamed and oh, what do people think if they hear about this? Uh, that's when you need the cell group the most. That's when you really need the brothers and sisters to come and bear your burdens with you. Amen. Our Chinese New Year gathering is a good example. You're 40 years old. You're not married. Perhaps you are a blue-collared worker. Nothing wrong with that. We honor these people. I'm just giving an example. Maybe all your cousins and relatives are doctors and lawyers and engineers, successfully married with kids and, you know, staying in nice homes. And you know what's waiting for you at those uh, CNY gatherings. Why aren't you married? Why don't you have a girlfriend? Why can't you improve yourself? Why can't you be like cousin so-and-so? And you know what happens when we, we lose face? We lose face. I used to be in that position, I know. We lose face and we fall into the trap of the enemy's condemnation. Maybe I'm just stupid. Maybe I'm useless. Maybe I'm just dumb. And a sense of worthlessness sweeps over you. And this happens to many, many of us. And that's how the devil brings us into condemnation because we feel shame. Now guilt, on the other hand, is internal. We cannot escape it by becoming invisible because your conscience accompanies you wherever you go. So guilt cultures are cultures of the ear, not the eye, all right? Now with this contrast in mind, we go back to the Garden of Eden and you will understand the story of the first sin because the first sin has to do with appearances, shame and sight in the eye. The serpent said to the woman, God knows that on the day that you eat of it, your eyes, watch this please, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. And that's exactly what happened. The eyes of the both of them were open and they realized that they were naked. Now the woman saw that the tree was good for food, desirable, watch, watch this, to the eyes. And the tree was a means of gaining wisdom. Before eating the fruit, the couple was naked and they were not ashamed. But the moment they ate the fruit, they felt shame and they sought to hide. So the key emotion in the whole Genesis story is the emotion of shame. Every element of the story, the fruit, the tree, the nakedness, the shame, all are visual elements of what is typically our culture, a shame culture. And the Lord comes walking in the garden. They heard God's voice and Adam said, I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked. And so I hid and God says, who said, who told you you were naked? And hiding means that I'm, I'm trying not to be seen. And that's the immediate intuitive response to shame. It's a default behavior of a lot of Christians. Instead of running to God, we run away from Him. I'm telling you this, my friends, whenever you get into trouble, run to Him, amen. Run to Him because that's the, the correct biblical response, amen. Now, how can you hide from a voice? God's voice was in the garden. How do you hide from a voice? The Bible says uh, that the just shall live by... Faith and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. That's how we live in the Christian life. And when it's not so much seeing, it's more hearing. But, but as Christians, we all want to see instead of hearing. And God has determined that in our lives, we learn to walk by faith. Jesus said, blessed are those who have heard and believed and yet not seen. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, the sin of Eve was, was uh, that she followed her eyes, not her ears. Her actions were determined by what she saw rather than what, the, what she heard, which was the command not to eat from the tree. The result was they acquired a knowledge of good and evil, but it was the wrong kind. Uh, together with that, they acquired an ethic of shame, not of guilt, but shame. And the guilt ethic is an inner voice that says, this is right, this is wrong, this is true, this is false, but a shame ethic is about social convention. It's a matter of meeting or not meeting the expectations of people around you. And this has to break in cornerstone, amen. Amen, we're all brothers and sisters here. We all make mistakes. It's not wrong to cut you some slack in your life, amen. And we've got to learn how to give each other room. And sometimes we need to give room to people to fail sometimes because people are going to fall and we've got to love them and we've got to see past their failures and learn to love them for who they are. Come on. Amen. Shame cultures have to do with social conformity. You know, the prophets and the patriarchs in the Bible were different. They were not conformed to the, uh, what everyone was else was doing. Abraham was willing to be on one side of the world and the rest of the world was on the other side. Haman, the man who tried to exterminate the Jews in the book of Esther says their customs are different from those of all other people. And that's why the world hates the Jew. And I'm telling you, if there's any time that the Jewish nation needs to support, it's now. 
And if there's any people that can stand and must stand with the Jewish people, it's the Christians. Amen. They are being persecuted everywhere. Did you know today, it's more dangerous to wear a kippah in London than it is to be a Jew in Israel. It is. You walk with a keeper anywhere in the world and you're a target for violence anywhere in the world because there's a spirit of anti-Semitism that's demonic and it's rising up today in the world and everywhere Christian, Jews are, they are being persecuted and the only people that are going to stand with them are the Christians. And I say, I say this and I know that, I, you know, sometimes we say these things and you know, there's pushback because people don't want you to rock the boat, but I cannot but say that what is true. What is true and what is right, amen. The Christians have a responsibility to stand with our brethren, the Jewish people. They might not know Jesus yet, they might not be saved, but we have a responsibility to stand in them, amen. One rabbi said the Jews have always been the iconoclast challenging the spirit of the age. The Christian faith is the same. It's a living protest against herd instinct. Christianity is the dissenting voice in the world of humankind, I tell you this, and the world, when the world loves you, my friends, the day the world loves you, you've crossed the line. You've gone too far into worldliness. True. The day you're no longer a mystery to the world is the day that you become sucked up into the system and you're no longer conform to the image of Christ and being salt and light. Jesus said to the religious rulers, He said, the world loves you because you are of the world. I tell you this more and more, we're going to find the world and the church at odds more and more. And there is a day that will come that God will draw a line, a clear dichotomy between the world and between the church. And you got to choose which side you're going to take. Amen. And I tell you, Jesus said the day is coming when, when you, the church, will be hated by all nations. What is in that scripture that we do not understand? What do you don't understand when Jesus said all nations will hate you? And so we got to learn to be stronger than ever before because we stand up for what is true and what is right in the eyes of God. Amen. Now, Christianity is not a matter of appearance. It's a matter of hearing and obeying the voice of God. The, well, one of the most famous commands in the Bible, in the Old Testament, is Shemai, O Israel. Like, uh, hear, O Israel. Hear, O Israel. What made Abraham, Moses, and the prophets different from their contemporaries was they heard the voice that others couldn't. So learn to be still. Learn to listen to the poetry of prayer. Learn to listen to the music of the Psalms. Learn to listen to your friends who love you and those you love and learn to listen to the voice of God. Amen. There's a fascinating story that illustrates this principle in the Bible. It's in Luke chapter 7. Let me give you the back story. A Pharisee had invited Jesus to have dinner with him to his house. Jesus obliges and goes to the house of the Pharisee and he sits reclined at the table, which means he's the honored guest. There was a woman in, who was well known in the city that lived as a, a sinful life. And she comes and anoints Jesus and washes his feet with her hair. I pick up the story in the parable in verses 44. And then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came. And you did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Three things that the host did not do for Jesus. He did not give him water to wash his feet. He did not give him the customary kiss on the cheek as an honored guest. And he did not anoint his head with oil. In the culture of the day, this is what you would do for a special guest. The fact that Jesus was reclining at the seat simply means that he was given the position of the honored guest. And as the honored guest, he was supposed to be treated with dignity and respect and honor. But as the honored guest, they caught, totally snubbed him. The custom of the day was you would give them the kiss to wash their feet and anoint their head with oil. But Jesus, listen to this, is, no, it's not the only guest. He was the honored guest though. And there were other guests. And when they came into the house, boy, they got the full works. Their feet were washed. They were anointed with, with oil. And they got the kiss on the cheeks. And everybody that came on that day got the full works except Jesus. And it was an entrapment. Watch this, please. What really was happening was he was being snubbed. They were inviting him not because they liked him, but they wanted to trap him. Let's invite Jesus. Let's dishonor him. Let's snub him. Let's see how he responds. He'll probably be insulted, storm out of the house. 
make a spectacle of himself. And then everybody will say, see, he's not what you thought he was. That's the backstory. And then there's this sinful woman that came and spoiled the whole thing. Hallelujah. How did she get into the picture? Now, if you don't understand the culture of the day, it seems like she gay crashed the party. No, sir, she did not do that. One of the things is that the Pharisees would have nothing to do with this sin sinful woman because in the, the days of the Bible, if you touch a woman who's defiled, what happens to you? You become defiled, you become unclean, and then you've got to go through the whole ritual thing and wash yourself again, you know? So the Pharisees did not invite this woman. Tradition tells us that this woman was Mary Magdalene, and I have no reason to doubt that. She was in all probability a former prostitute. She had an alabaster box of perfume, and it was something that prostitutes carried with themselves to refresh themselves every once in a while. So from culture and from history, we have a clue to what kind of this woman she was when the Bible calls her a sinner. Okay, now in those days, the general public didn't have much for entertainment, no Xboxes, no internet and things like that, right? So rich people have, would have these lavish parties and they would open the porch where the general public would come and gawk at these rich people. That's what they would do, right? It's like the Academy Awards and all these famous people walking down the, the, the red carpet and everybody's gawking at the, uh, at the uh, famous uh, idols, all right? Same thing in those days, okay? They would come and watch the rich people have their lavish parties. Now, please, ladies and gentlemen, I want you to come with me. I want you to imagine that you're part of the story, okay? You're part of the audience. You're watching. You're wondering what's going to happen. You see them honor every guest and you see them dishonoring Jesus, the rabbi. You're watching and uh, you notice that they're treating Jesus dishonorably but you just ignore it. I, yeah, I, I guess the religious leaders know what they're doing. So let's not say anything. Let's not rock the boat. Everything is going much to plan. They're seeing how Jesus is going to, to react. And suddenly, bam! The whole thing turns upside down because a woman jumps up and runs into the crowd, into the party, and she messes up the whole plan. Woohoo! She breaks free from the crowd, rushes in, catches everyone by surprise, stands before Jesus. She's weeping and what she does, she takes her hand, wipes the feet, uh, his, uh, tears off his feet and uh, everybody is in shock and the Pharisees wanted to insult Jesus but now a, a woman comes to honour him in the midst of everybody. Now, of course, they react by saying, if this man were a prophet, he knew who you would know what kind of a woman she was. And they said this because, again, in that culture, if you touch a woman who is defiled, you become unclean, right? But Jesus turns the whole thing around and he says, Simon, I have something to say to you. And then he gives them a parable and he, and he says, you know, when I came into your house, you dishonored me. You didn't give me the kiss. You didn't wash my feet. You didn't honor, honor my head with oil. This woman has not stopped kissing my feet. She has anointed my head with perfume. And she has uh, washed my feet and, oh my goodness. And, um, and then he says to her, woman, your sins are forgiven you. Now, when Jesus said that to the woman, in the Greek sentencing of the tense, it gives us the idea that she had been forgiven at another time. So in actuality, this was not her first encounter with Jesus. There was a previous occasion where she had heard Jesus preach, repented of her sins, had been forgiven. So she is no longer unclean. She is no longer the sinful woman that everyone thought she was. Her sins had already been forgiven. I want to say and declare this to you, that if you don't know it today, if you believe in Jesus Christ, and you've been born again, your sins are forgiven you. And I want to say to you, you are clean, amen? You are clean and every day all we need is to get our foot washed by the water of the Word and by the blood of Jesus. That's all we need to do. We are already pronounced clean and that's why your children are separate and sanctified because you're a believer. Amen. You got to believe that. You got to believe that, my friends. Amen. She was no longer the sinful woman that everybody thought she was. And because she had forgiven much, she loved much. And Jesus said, he who had been forgiven little loves little. And this was again a rebuke to the Pharisees. Is there anybody here in Cornerstone who has been forgiven little? Or you think that you've been forgiven little? If you think you've been forgiven little, then you will love little and it will show up in the way you honour Jesus. I can tell you this for sure, guarantee. When a man does not honour Jesus, it's not because he has a love problem. It's not a love problem. It's a debt problem. You just don't realise how much he has forgiven you. And if you perceive yourself as having little debt, you will have little love. When Jesus told the parable of the lost sheep, he talked about the shepherd going out and seeking the one lost sheep and how heaven rejoices 
when one lost sheep repents rather than 99 that need no repentance. Again, this was a poke at the Pharisees because there are no 99 people that don't need repentance. They only think they exist. They, they don't exist, ladies and gentlemen. If you have 99 people that don't need to repent, then you've got 99 people that are going to hell. That's it. So how do you apply, for, apply this to us today? Well, the truth is most of our churches tend to treat Jesus in a very controlled, very unemotional manner. And that, that, that's why revival never happens on a Sunday morning. Right? Because right here in the crowd, there are many reserved people, very dignified people. Woo! The very same people here in this crowd. In a football match, you go crazy and wild. <laughs> Liverpool is playing, you are screaming and shouting. Ah. You don't care what people, you're rowdy, you're emotional, you enter, you scream and you shout, and nobody says, ah, that's just emotionalism. No, sir. But the same people, the same people that are in this room, especially the Liverpool crowd. <laughs> come to church very reserved, respectable, afraid of offending people. When you raise your hands, you're just like halfway, you know, I don't know, like, you know. I don't want to dance just now. Let everybody have breath, let have breath. Nobody was dancing. Too respectable. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to open the windows of heaven to the Holy Spirit and let Him come in. I, I, I don't want these controlled services anymore in Cornerstone. I'm tired of them. I don't want predictable services. I want somebody to run up to the front and bow at His feet and say, Jesus, I want everything that you have. Is there anybody who will do it? <laughs> I'm waiting for the day. I'm telling you, I'm waiting for the day when someone would just dash out, fall in his face, lie prostrate and say, Jesus, I give my heart to you. Amen. And I tell you, all of heaven will stop and say, look at that. Look at that. Mary Magdalene was caught in a moment of time. What she did is known forever. She's standing there in the crowd. She's an outcast. She watches the one she loves being dishonored. Suddenly there's a disturbance on the inside of her. She is distress, uh, even though she knows her place, is to stay out and shut up because you're a woman. And not just a woman, you're a sinner. She says to herself, how dare they treat my Jesus that way? Before she could even think, leaps over, gate crashes the party, as if to say, you are not going to treat my Jesus this way. If you will not honour him, I will honour him. And that woman breaks every tradition, probably even risk her life. But she says, it doesn't matter. I'm going to, I'm going to honor him. If you're going to insult him, I'm going to honor him. And suddenly, ladies and gentlemen, we don't have a story anymore. We have a moment in time for eternity. And all of a sudden, I'm telling you, when she ran out and she came at the feet of Jesus, I am sure all of heaven stopped at that one moment and they froze and they watched this on the giant screens, video screens in heaven. And they watched that one moment where that woman came and well knelt at the feet of Jesus and wept at his feet. And all of heaven gawked in astonishment and they rejoiced and praised because what this woman did, turn the story around, hallelujah. And she honored Jesus and she said to herself, I was born for a moment like this. My whole goal is to honor Jesus. If the world, even if the world snubs him, I will bring honor to my king. And if I have to rock the boat, I will rock the boat. And we, we all have that one moment, I believe, in time where everything hinges on us standing up and saying, you will not dishonor my Jesus. And when you take a stand, you throw the whole system off. Are you willing to break free from the world of bystanders and be a vessel of honor for Jesus? It's time for you to be aware of his presence more than the presence of other people. It's the sinful woman was an outcast, but she is remembered forever, forever in the annals of heaven. Hallelujah. She is given an honor very few people have been given. So stop wondering what people think of you. But if you really know the truth, no one is even thinking of you. No one. Don't think that you're more important than you, you know, what will people think of you? They're not even thinking of you, my goodness. How many of you in this room like candy? You like candy? How many of you got a sweet tooth? I have a sweet tooth. I'm sure we all do. Like candy, chocolates. The problem with a lot of Christianity is like candy. You feed the people with candy, then you got to keep on feeding them with candy. And the day gets, and it gets tough because the day will come when you run out of candy. Why? Because the Bible is not candy. 
So you run out of ideas from social media. Pretty soon you'll have a whole group of people just wanting to be entertained. Uh, and uh, you know that I will never feed you sugar water and neither will I ever sugarcoat the gospel. Amen. Now, most of us men, we know this. Before we got married, most of us were quite romantic. <laughs> True? You bought flowers. You gave your wife, your girlfriend cards. Bought chocolates for our girlfriends. And once you got married, ladies and gentlemen, it is not realistic to live like this at this level. I cannot be giving my wife chocolates every week. <laughs> True? I cannot be giving her flowers every week. I cannot be superman to her every day. I have to be regular man and she has got to learn to love the regular man. She has got to learn to love the man without the candy. Amen. Man was uh, with a wife one day and they were sipping wine on a beautiful moonlit night in a very romantic place. And, had, uh, and they were drinking their wine. And the man says to the wife, I love you. She said, uh, the, the wife said to the man, I love you. And the man said, is that you speaking or the wine? <laughs> she said, no, it's me speaking to the wine. <laughs> <laughs> Could it be that our Lord is hurt because our relationship with Him is so shallow, so superficial that we get bored so easily? Well, what's the next one? What's the next plan? You know, what's the next thing that's going to happen? And we all have to have candy to be entertained or we get bored. I desire for Cornerstone to be a church that's in love with Jesus. I want you to come to church because you love Him. I want you to come to church when it's raining. Pastor was telling me, Pastor Young, in this church in America, when it rains, 60% of the church don't show up. That's how much they love him. I want you to come when there are no special speakers. In fact, in Cornerstone, when there are no special speakers, more people come. I don't know why. <laughs> you strange bunch. I, really, I tell my friend, this church is very strange. You, I want you to tithe because you love Jesus. Amen. Uh, everything has to be done because of the motivation is of love. I, I, I want this church to be able to stand for 45 minutes and worship and no one's complaining. Amen. Now I'm telling you this, when, the, when there's an anointing in worship, I want to open the doors and I, I don't have to preach on Sundays. There are days that when the presence of God is so strong, let's continue to worship. You don't have to hear my preaching every day. You want to just get on me on, on, online. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's do something crazy. Let's, let's get out of the box. Amen. Let's not allow the, the, the cons, cons, constraints of time and the structure box us in. We want Holy Ghost to move in this church. Amen. 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 And I don't want to give anyone candy anymore. And I don't want anybody in Cornerstone to be bored with Jesus. Amen. I close with this. David was bringing the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. Danced with all his might. He was wearing a linen ephod. They're little, short little skirts. They, were, they didn't cover the legs, right? So David would come and he would leap and twirl and, and it, would, it would be quite embarrassing sometimes because there were women around. And, and you know, David couldn't care less. He was so happy that the Ark of the Covenant was finally coming into Zion. But David had a wife called Michal. Michal was watching through the window and she despised and detested David. And when David came into the house, she said, you are an embarrassing man. Embarrass me before all of Israel. And wearing a linen effort like this and dancing. And David said, no, I didn't embarrass anyone. The women that you think that I embarrassed them, they are praising the Lord and God is pleased with me because I did that. Ladies, here's a word for all the wives. Stop complaining about your husband. Please, I'm asking you, your husband is your covering. You don't fight against your covering, amen. Pray for them. If you find them difficult, pray for them. But don't speak against them. Because if you do, the Bible, what's happened to, to, to Michael, she was barren for the rest of her life. And barrenness means God's not doing anything in your life anymore. That's it. You have just no more productivity, no more fruitfulness, no more children. Nothing. One last thing. When you express the over-the-top enthusiasm and honor for Jesus, you'll be criticized. Sometimes people say, ah, that, per that person always like this, you know, crazy. Every time all the call come up. Then don't, don't care what people say, right? I went up salvation all the call five times at least. 
I, I got saved the first one, but I wanted to make sure. So five times I, I came up five times. Didn't you? Just wanted to make sure. You heard the story. I'll tell you this uh, for some of you who have not heard this story. 22 years ago, I was suffering from migraines. Once a month, twice a month. When I get those migraines, it spoils my day. You know how it is. When you get a migraine, your whole day is ruined. Go into your room, sh shut the windows, pop two pills, try to sleep, sleep it off, right? It takes about 24 hours to get the migraines out. One day I was having lunch with uh, my friend who is a pastor. We were in Orchard Road in the middle of a, we were in the middle of a Chinese restaurant and our table was right in the center of the restaurant and I could feel the migraine coming. I said to my friend, oh my goodness, I feel this migraine coming. And he said to me, Pastor, I have an anointing to pray for people with migraines. Could I pray for you? He said, this anointing is unusual. I pray for people with other sicknesses. They don't seem to get healed. But when I pray for people that with migraines, they always get healed. It's an anointing. I said, yes, pray for me. And I didn't expect this, but he got up in the middle of the restaurant, laid his hands on my head, and he's praying in tongues at the top of his voice. Shama Rababa, in the name of Jesus, be healed. I was so embarrassed, my friends. I'm telling you this because I was looking around. Everybody was looking around, so I slipped down quietly. In, <laughs> on the and in that moment of embarrassment, I felt the Holy Spirit say to me, do you want to be embarrassed or do you want to be healed? I said, I want to be healed. I reached out in faith 22 years ago. I've never had a migraine since, not a single migraine. I broke free from the crowd of bystanders, believed, laid a hold of God and got my miracle. Let's all stand in the presence of God. Amen. Many years ago, I'll close with this story. And uh, many years ago, I was in an event and a VVIP was there. He was speaking and, um, and in the meeting, he said something that, I totally disagreed, totally disagreed. It was a very small, private meeting. Um, and um, I won't tell you what kind of a meeting it was, but it was a private meeting. And he was a VVIP, a right? very, very significant leader here in this country. And he said something that I did not agree. So I plucked up the courage, took a deep breath, and I raised my hands. I said, sir, can I ask you a question? Right in the middle of his speech, he looked at me, says, yes. So I, I, I told him what I thought about what he said. And he was not happy. He raised his voice. I raised my voice. He raised his voice. I raised my voice. It became, it escalated very quickly. The chairman was very embarrassed. Uh, so he jumped in. He said, uh, the meeting is close. I could hear a pin drop. They never ever experienced something like this before. And I went up to this VVIP. I said, sir, I'm very sorry if you, if you I came across too aggressively. I feel strongly about this. And um, I want to apologize to you. He looked at me, he says, who are you? He wasn't saying it condescendingly. He wanted to know, who, what, what do you do? I said, I'm a pastor, I'm a nobody. And uh, that basically led to a conversation about 10 minutes about life after death. If I mention his name, everybody will know who he is. So I won't. But I, I want to just tell you, it was that one moment in time where I felt the Lord says, now you can correct the misconceptions about what he's saying and it will cost you it will cost you but I want you to be bold for me my friends there are moments in time where you just sometimes have to stand up and say look what you said was not correct and I need to correct that perception so I want to pray for you today that God will break you free from the shackles of uh, your dignity your, the shackles that bind you are shackles of respectability and may Jesus set you free today to express. That's why I say to you, when you are praying at home, get down on your knees when you pray. Rely prostrate on the floor because if you'll do that, then coming to church and kneeling is, is easy for you. But if you, if you express the joy here in the church, if you don't do it back home and then you come to church and raise your hands, then you're just an actor. You're just a hypocrite. You only do it when people are around, but when nobody's around, you won't do it. I want to encourage you to cultivate the habit of worshipping Jesus unlavishly in your own home. Amen. So Father, I thank you and I pray in Jesus' name right now over this room. I break every chain, Lord, of, 
of this um, uh, un, un, unrighteous dignity, Lord. I break the chains, Lord, of this respectability that the demons of respectability hold us back and we will not express how we feel to Jesus. Lord, I know you're never embarrassed when we fall at your feet. You are never embarrassed when a man screams and say, God, I want you with all my heart. I believe that all of heaven watches those moments, Lord, in time when we give our all to you. So I pray here in Cornerstone that you remove every barrier so that in our services, there will be a free flow of the Holy Ghost. There will be prophecies. There will be wish visions. There will be tongues and interpretation of tongues. And there will be a free flow of the river of God in this house. So bless this house in Jesus' name with every spiritual blessing and let not the sin of respectability hold us back. Now, before I close in prayer, if you need prayer for healing or whatever that you need prayer for, just come to the front. We have a team of very anointed people, very anointed people to pray with you and pray for you. So the blessing of God the Father, the blessing of God the Son, and the blessing of God the Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you now and forevermore. And everybody said, Amen. Let's give God a big praise. God bless you. Have a great day. You're dismissed. Have a great weekend. Drive safe. Thank you very much. God bless you.